The first rule of Fight Club is, you do not talk about Fight Club. Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 93 of Movies Are Awesome, the show all about recycling plastic. My name is Nathan Pottle and thank you so much for joining me today. Today I'm talking about an underrated classic in my opinion, one of the unsung heroes of the Pixar movies. We're talking about A Bug's Life and my wife and I just rewatched this movie last night and we just so thoroughly enjoyed it and when I'm talking about the best Pixar movies, A Bug's Life often doesn't come up in the conversation. You know, you have Toy Story, you have Coco and Up, Ratatouille, WALL-E. A lot of these movies come to the forefront when it comes to Pixar but very rarely do we mention A Bug's Life as one of those stronger Pixar films. And I think that it is a really strong and unique movie, and I want to talk about it. So this is what we're talking about today. A Bug's Life came out in 1998 and it's directed by John Lasseter. And I am going to be talking about the story and the plot points throughout the entire thing. This movie is over 20 years old, so... I don't think I need to do a non-spoiler and spoiler section, so let's just talk about it. Basically, the story is Flick the Ant causes a rift between the ants and the grasshoppers. The grasshoppers are this gang who quote-unquote give the ants protection, and in exchange the ants give them a portion of their food. And Flick made their offering of food fall into the river, and so the grasshoppers are demanding more food, and Flick goes on a journey to find warrior bugs who can come to the ant colony and protect all of the ants. And through a series of misunderstandings, he hires circus performers to come and protect his people. Spectacular misunderstandings because it really is the things that these guys misunderstand from each other is just so ridiculous and so perfectly lined up that if one of them would have said even one thing different, none of this would have ever happened. When Flick goes into the city to find all of these bugs, and the circus performers were just fired because they lit their boss on fire, P.T. Flea, they are drinking in a bar, and they come across these flies that they saw at the circus, and they get into a big bar fight, and Flick determines that these guys are fierce fighting bugs, but in fact, they're actually just playing a role, and it's not like it is at all. And when the bugs get to the ant colony, the ladybug Francis says that when the grasshoppers get there, they're going to knock them dead. And he's speaking from a point of, we're going to knock their socks off with how good of a performance we'll put on. But everyone else thinks that they're going to actually just knock them dead because they want to fight the grasshoppers. And oh my goodness, this movie was just a delight to watch. And then... As the story moves on, we have all of the other misunderstandings that happen, and then the ants contrive this plan to build a fake bird to swoop down over the anthills so that they can scare the grasshoppers away and not actually have to fight them. Now, it has been a few years since I've watched A Bug's Life, and last night was actually the first time that I did not watch A Bug's Life on VHS. We watched it on Disney+, Plus, so we streamed it. Now, I do take some issue with streaming videos and the compression and the overall video quality that you lose when you watch something over streaming as opposed to on physical media. But I have to say that streaming this looks way better than watching it on a VHS, and I've never seen A Bug's Life look so good. I don't know when they did any kind of remastering to it, but it, it just looked amazing, especially considering that it came out in 1998, and just a few years before it was Toy Story, and Looking back at Toy Story on my Blu-ray, it doesn't look this good, and just goes to show that three years after Toy Story came out, this came out, and even from the release of Toy Story up until the release of Bugs Life, Pixar's technology just advanced so much since then that it looks really good, and I have I have very little complaints about the visual aspect of this movie. One thing that I do take a little bit of issue with the movie, though, is it, is there's a lot of hilarious moments and a lot of dramatic moments and it sometimes isn't as great at balancing those two as it is throughout the rest of the film there are a few moments where it's serious and then they crack a joke and you're like oh okay like 
and I was just sitting there watching and I, okay, there's a little bit of levity being injected into the scene because maybe it's too dramatic. And sometimes I don't, I don't like when they do that. That's one of the big issues that I have with the Marvel movies is when something big and dramatic is happening. Someone cracks a joke and haha, it's very funny and it doesn't always work for me. So that's one thing in Bugs Life that I didn't like that much. And I think primarily that happens with a lot of the circus characters because they're supposed to be comedians and performers and artists. And every time Slim the stick bug is on screen, there's always some kind of joke about him being a stick or he's a sword or you use him to hit other bugs with. And there's just all, all of these jokes. It just keeps going on and on and on. I, I like running jokes when they're funny and I don't think that the stick bug joke maybe maybe it doesn't work as well as other running jokes that I've seen in other movies. Like I said, though, this movie is dramatic, and it has dramatic, scary things going on in it, and the main reason for any of the dramatic stuff is because of Hopper, who is the leader of the Grasshoppers. He is voiced by Kevin Spacey, and Kevin Spacey is just terrifying when he plays a villain. He's a very good bad guy. I really like his voice performance in this. I think he's really good. I... Of all the voice performances in this movie, he, his is probably the best. Um, probably because he's given the most to do. He's given the most gravitas. His character Hopper, he has a few really good speeches where he talks about uh, the ants outnumbering all of the grasshoppers. And the ants aren't allowed to figure that out. So they have to keep the ants in place by ruling through fear. That's a really great moment in the movie for me. And then, of course, there's the really dramatic moments at the end where everything is on fire and... Flick is getting beat up by the by the one grasshopper who's a dog, like a rabid animal kind of thing. I don't know exactly how that works, but it's there and you enjoy it, right? He's a, he's a scary grasshopper who growls and beats people up and Hopper is just going crazy and Flick says to everybody that Hopper was going to squish the queen and Hopper is like, I hate it when people give spoilers and beats up Flick some more and then he's going to kill him and then that's when we have the real emotional and physical climax of the movie when all the ants decide to defend themselves and they fight all the grasshoppers and everybody runs away except for Hopper and then they fight against the bird but it's not the fake bird it's a real bird and then Hopper gets eaten and that's the end of the movie. Ta-da! Done. End of review. That was easy wasn't it? It's a good movie you should watch it. No, I'm, I'm not done. I have other things to talk about. I really like Hopper as a character and I really like the monologues that he gives Anytime he speaks, he's just very captivating. I find the things that he has to say very interesting, and I understand him as a character, and that's what I always want out of an antagonist. I want to be able to understand their point of view, but not necessarily agree with it. And I think that Hopper is a villain that has that, has that aspect to him that I really enjoy. Our main character, Flick, he, he's a character who everyone sees as an outcast and a failure and everything he does is stupid and he's an inventor. And they're like, oh, like, there goes Flick, the loser, is kind of how he's seen in the village. And the only reason that he's allowed to go on the expedition to find these warrior bugs is because the other ants in the college just want him gone. Just give us a little bit of a break. So they send him on this journey and he goes to the city and he has a fun time and... Even this one mission that that he came up with that he's really excited about going on, he even messes that up and it's just one more thing, one more mistake that he adds to his list of mistakes and it's hard on his character. He goes through some tough stuff and then when everyone discovers that the warriors are not warriors, he gets exiled and he goes off with the circus performers and he's really in a low state, you know, like he's very depressed about all the things that he's been through and how everyone sees him. But then Dot, the princess, she comes flying in and she's able to convince him otherwise by giving him a rock. And, okay, at the beginning of this movie, Flick is trying to convince Dot that it's okay to be small because you're going to grow. And in order to do that, he picks up a rock and he says, like, okay, pretend this rock is a seed. And she just can't get over the fact that she's holding a rock and not a seed. And he is so frustrated by the end of this conversation because he just is trying to give her this metaphor and she won't get it because she's too fixated on the fact that she's holding a rock instead of a seed. And then later that comes up again when she gives him a rock and then the circus performer is like, what is with the rock? Like, it must be something that ants do. 
And then at the end of the movie, we see it again where the circus performers give Princess Ada a rock and everyone in the ant colony is like, what's with the rock? Oh, it must be a thing that circus performers do. So it, that's a running joke that works for me. I think that that's something that's really funny that comes up a few times in the film that really works as opposed to the stick bug hitting people joke. I think that one doesn't work as well. But Flick is a character that I like and I find that he can be really relatable with a lot of people because I think a lot of people are their own harshest critics and so anytime they do something they'll be like, oh well this is no good because of this. Even though other people aren't necessarily saying, hey what you're doing is no good, if you're saying it to yourself, it, it's, it's just as good as if other people are telling you that you're not good, right? So I think that he's relatable in that sense. And then obviously Princess Ada, it's revealed that she has very similar feelings because she's training to be the queen. And she thinks that everyone thinks that she's not able to do the job. And Flick is trying to be reassuring to her saying like, no, 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 no. You're able to do this. You're going to be a good queen. And Princess Ada just is not buying it. And I think that's... And that's kind of the difference that I was talking about where Flick is having people tell him that he's no good, but Princess Ada is telling herself that she's not good and just projecting it onto other people. And I think that it helps us as the audience see both of these characters have this moment where they both talk about how everyone is waiting for them to screw up and then they form that bond and then obviously they form more of a romance and they're a couple by the end of the movie and it's all very happy and everybody's just having a great time. So I like Princess Ada as a character. She's voiced by Julia Louis de Free, who plays Elaine in Seinfeld, and she was very famous in the 1990s, and that's why she's in this movie now. Another character that I really like is Molt, who is Hopper's brother. I cannot remember the name of the actor who voices Molt, but it's the same guy who voices Bing Bong and in Inside Out. So if you're familiar with that voice, it's the same guy. And Molt, he's a comic relief character, but he, he's really funny. He plays Hopper's brother, and every time Hopper is around and Molt has something to say, it's generally pretty funny. He's purely there to make us laugh, and I feel that he does that. So, so because he fulfills his purpose as a character, I really like him, and I feel like he works. So Molt is a good character as well. Most of the circus performers I like as well. There's Francis the Ladybug, the stick bug is named Slim, Dim is the Dung Beetle, um, the Black Widow is named, oh, I don't know, but she's voiced by Betty somebody. I can't remember, but she also voices Sally in Cars, and she's another voice in Pixar somewhere else too. She's in, I think, a few different Pixar movies, and I just can't remember. Normally I would pull out my phone and look up what else she's in but my phone is upstairs charging so I'm not gonna go and get it because I don't really need to know this information so it's fine but getting back on topic then we have the leader of the circus performers his name is P.T. Flea and he is voiced by John Rassenberger who appears in every single Pixar film uh, in some he's more recognizable than others you can't really pick out who he is in Brave because he's using a funny accent and you can't really pick out who he is in Coco as well. But for the most part, he has a recognizable voice. He's, he's Ham in Toy Story. He's P.T. Flea in Bugs Life. He's the Abominable Snowman in Monsters, Inc. He's Mac the Semi-Truck in Cars. He's just all over the place. He's in every single Pixar movie. You can find him. He's in the credits. He voices something somewhere. Just like how the Pizza Planet truck also appears in every single Pixar movie somewhere. You just gotta find it. In some movies, it's easier to notice than others. In this one, it's pretty easy because there's a trailer park home, uh, a mobile home, that's what they're called, and the Pizza Planet truck is outside parked next to it. It's very easy to see. So there's an Easter egg for you right there. If you didn't know, Pixar does all kinds of Easter eggs of their own movies within their universe. You can read the Pixar theory if you want, and you can buy into it or you can nod about how all Pixar movies exist within the same universe and you can go through and someone made a big timeline of where all the Pixar movies fit and how they relate to each other and all these different things. I don't buy into the Pixar theory, but it's fun to read about. It's fun to think about. 
It's a lot like the Star Wars ring theory, which I find interesting. Also don't 100% buy into it, but I find the Star Wars ring theory to be more plausible than the Pixar theory. So it's worth looking into if you want to check it out and see what other people think about the Pixar movies and how they tie into one another. It's, it's, it's a fun thing as opposed to just saying, oh, Pixar's making a fourth wall breaking reference to their own movie. It's taking those references and tying them into other movies saying, no, these references are here because they're part of a larger universe. And it, it's an interesting thing to think about. I'm going to move on though. I want to talk about my favorite part of this movie. When we watched it last night, my wife and I were just dying of laughter because we did not remember how funny this scene was. It was, it's just comedic gold. When the circus performers first get to the ant colony and everyone thinks that they're warriors and they're throwing a huge party in welcome of them. So everyone, they're having this feast and it's just going spectacularly and nobody knows that they're not warriors yet. Flick doesn't know, the circus performers don't know that these guys think that they're warriors, and this is the moment when it's revealed. So Mr. Soil, who is one of the teachers, he comes up and he introduces his uh, second grade class in order to give them a performance. And so the South Tunnel Elementary School second grade class presents the warriors with a mural they have drawn of fighting the grasshoppers away. And if you look at the mural it's vicious and it's bloody and the grasshoppers are dead and bleeding everywhere and heimlich the caterpillar is cut in half and he's bleeding everywhere and so the circus performers are looking at this mural and realizing what's going on but then it doesn't end there the the second grade class has an entire performance that they've created demonstrating what the warriors are going to do in order to save all of the ants from the terrible fate of the grasshoppers. So the, these kids are putting on this performance. And what's great about this is, is if you take the time to look at the kids in the performance, they're acting exactly how children are when you go to their performances at school. There's one kid who's just like swaying back and forth. There's one kid who's blinking his eyes one at a time, practicing winking on either side of their face. There's one kid who's frowning and just absolutely does not want to be there. And when he delivers his lines, who will come to save us poor ants? And then he crosses his arms and he looks all pouty. When you look at these kids, it's just, it's so funny. And it so accurately depicts how kids act in these school performances that it's wonderful to watch it's hilarious it's my favorite scene in the movie i think it's so so funny my wife and i we were just laughing and laughing and laughing because it had been so long since we watched the movie we completely forgot just how good that scene is so that's probably my favorite scene in the movie i also really like when the bird attacks for the first time and they save princess dot i think that that's a really good scene. It also is another demonstration of a spectacular misunderstanding between all of the characters. So I, I think that part's good too. One thing that I need to mention when talking about A Bug's Life is another movie about ants came out in 1998 and that is Ants. And I do believe it's a Woody Allen movie and it was meant to be this like rival, like they were squaring off against each other. Every now and then in Hollywood, you get two movies that come out at around the same time that are pretty much the same thing. We have Bugs Life and Ants both came out in the same year in 2007, I want to say, or 2006. We had The Prestige and The Illusionist. Those came out at the same time. There, there, are, there are a few instances like this where very similar movies come out at the same time and you kind of have to pick one and pick a side. So that, I don't know, you can be part of one of their teams, I guess. Another example is Captain America Civil War and Batman v Superman came out in the same year. I think it's no contest. Captain America Civil War is way, way better. The Prestige is much better than The Illusionist. And A Bug's Life is much better than Ants. I, there's generally a clear winner when these things happen. So I think that A Bug's Life is the clear winner because... A Bug's Life is a movie that I return to and I keep watching, and I haven't watched Ants since I was a kid. 
since I was a little kid and it was on TV. Like we didn't like we watched it and we we're like, oh, OK, it's it's fine. Nowhere near as good as A Bug's Life. I don't think it's as cleverly written. I don't think it's as well animated. I don't think the characters are as fun. Just just overall, A Bug's Life is better. Now, like I said at the beginning of the episode, I don't think A Bug's Life is as recognized as it should be. It was Pixar's second movie, and following up from Toy Story, I think it could have paled in comparison. And then the next movie after that was Toy Story 2, which is also very well received. So I think that A Bug's Life is something that isn't as looked at as closely when talking about the best Pixar movies, but I think it definitely should at least be in the conversation. I think it's a very well-written movie. I think it's well-executed. And it, I, I just, I don't really have that much bad stuff to say about A Bug's Life. So I'm not gonna say anything bad about A Bug's Life because I don't have anything. So I think that's pretty much it for this review. I think A Bug's Life is a very good movie. I think you should give it a watch. But if you have seen A Bug's Life, I would love to know what you think about it. Do you like it better than Ants or do you like Ants better? Please feel free to let me know. You can reach out to me on social media. You can find me on Twitter at Poddle Nathan and you can find the show on Instagram at Movies Are Awesome Podcast. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to subscribe to the show. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and a whole bunch of other places. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. It was kind of a short and sweet one, which is fine. That happens sometimes, but I appreciate you sticking around and listening to this review from a movie from 1998. If you ever have a recommendation on a movie review or a topic you'd like to hear me talk about, please feel free to reach out and let me know. You can find all the contact information that I mentioned before in the show notes. So thank you very much once again. And as always, if you have nothing else to do, go watch more movies.